Welcome to the second video on how to build a bicycle generator. This is a step-by-step -step one. So I'm going to show you how to start from scratch and build a generating base unit. That's the bike, the stand and the generating capacity with an output. This one obviously is a lot more complicated than that now. If you haven't seen the first video, I recommend you start with that one because that gives you a demonstration of this machine as it is now. I'll take you through it, show you what I've done with it and show you a demonstration, charging stuff and all that kind of thing. So I recommend you start with that one and there's a link in the description below uh, to that video. There's also a third video which is whether you should use an AC motor or a DC motor or an alternator to generate power. So it's a bit of a more technical video but it's something that when you doing a project like this a lot of people sort of get stuck on and aren't sure which to use so that video just goes through the the, the pros and cons of each type because depending on what you want to do uh, it depends on which choice you make really in terms of generation this video doesn't go into that it assumes you're going to use an alternator so an alternator from a car because that's what i've used uh, for this machine because it was just easier for this project so that's the assumption on this one. The instructions aren't that different really for the other types of generator, but there are specific different things. And I'll mention those as we go through the, the steps. Let's get to it. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. That's the bike as it came from eBay, eBay special, as you can tell, 30 or 40 quid. That's not part of the build, but I thought I'd include it because it just shows what the bike looks like in the magnetic trainer stand, which I'm guessing most people will, will be familiar with, but just in case. I put a new saddle on, of course, and new bar tape and bars and, and all that kind of thing. But um, these sort of bikes are pretty easy to pick up from eBay and you can make them a bit more comfortable and to your specification afterwards the mag trainer comes these are yeah again probably 30 40 quid you can pick them up for uh, it's got a magnetic training apparatus on the back that just works with friction with a rear tire just rubs on it that's going to come off so we're going to take that off later in the build as you'll see but these stands are really convenient they've got nice hand winding uh, handles on the outside there that push these spindles into the wheel and they clamp onto any type of wheel pretty much quick release bolt through whatever so makes it nice and convenient for using different types of bike you can of course bolt the wheel in using angle brackets you know something like that but it's more faff and this gives a little bit of movement side to side movement in the wheel as you pedal in so it's just a very slightly more natural feel for the bike as you ride in first build step so you can see there the base and that's been cut from MDF actually it wasn't cut it was a piece that I had knocking about from a different project it's inch thick so it gives it a good amount of stability and when you've got a bike on there and you've got stuff bolted to it stability is good stops it moving around uh, or rocking you know so that that's a good thing plywood equally good really just make sure it's uh, it's a good thickness although inch thick might be slightly overkill because it's very heavy so you could probably get away with three quarter or something like that Alternator there, ready to go on. You can see it's got a bolt in it just there. That will bolt into these uh, brackets here. Again, I had these brackets already. I had to cut slots out of them with an angle grinder. So I recommend you get ones that you don't need to angle grind because that's just a faff. Bolts there to connect the alternator to the brackets and screws there to screw the brackets down to the base. Alternators always have uh, good sturdy mounting brackets because they're made to fit in a car and obviously they get bashed around all over the place in a car so uh, the, the the fittings are really strong for them that's another plus for using an alternator really remember when you're sighting this and measuring up you want the pulley in the middle 
not the alternator body itself because the bike needs to be central on the plinth. So that pulley needs to be in the middle when you, when you mount it up. You want the alternator mounted nice and secure onto the base uh, because there's quite a lot of force uh, once you're pedaling and you've got an electrical load in the circuit, there's quite a bit of force pulling the alternator forwards. So it does need to be really securely bolted down. Uh, that's maybe slightly overkill to be honest, but um, I had the brackets and I had the holes, so I thought I'd put screws in. So this ain't going anywhere, is it? So set up, spaced properly, good pulley there ready to use and we've got the cables coming out the alternator ready to connect to the circuit just there. That's just a wider view really so that's showing some of the tools that we used and showing the plinth that's cut uh, nice and square there. Actually this it wasn't long enough to have the entire bike on it so a whole bike with the alternator off the back and the stand in there is actually quite a, a significant length so Either you need a piece of wood long enough or you need two and bolt them together, which is what I did ultimately with, with this one. You don't need a drill for much. Drill is just for drilling pilot holes for the screws really in the wood. Uh, not a lot of other, other drilling needed, uh, just to make sure you don't, you don't split the wood really. So that's the next phase. You can see the alternators bolted in there on the brackets and you can see the stand here, which is on there. You'll notice that I've taken the magnetic training apparatus off. Usually they just bolt on. Uh, do make sure you get one that you can take off because you don't want one that's welded on because then it won't be any good because you, you can't really use it with that, uh, that magnetic friction thing on there. And the friction interface is much less efficient than a drive belt. So it's, drive belt is definitely the way to go. Just make sure when you are looking at the size of the alternator that you purchased and the brackets and where it sits that you've got enough clearance there for the belt to clear that beam at the bottom. Because if you if it's rubbing on that beam, you're generating friction and heat, which you don't want in the system. You know, it's just gonna make it harder to pedal really, and you might get some deformation on the belt over time. So just make sure that's, that's set up well. You can see there that I've connected a cable coming off the bracket here. So that's bolted in there. That's because the electrical connection to the alternator the negative connection goes through the casing of the alternator. So the whole case of the alternator functions as, as the negative terminal. So just make sure you've got a clean connection. When you bolt that through, make sure that the alternator, if you got it from a scrap yard or off a UA or something, just give it a good clean up on the connectors, uh, on the bolt, you know, the bolt sites, so that you get a good electrical connection on there. And then you can use your brackets then to, to for all your negative terminals. So the one from the battery, that, that will go onto the battery next and then other negatives from the circuit downstream, if you will, uh, will will be clamped into there as well. So that's a, a wider view again, and that's just setting up the uh, setting up the the system. What I'm doing there is just making sure I've got enough tension on this belt. So what you what you're looking for with tension on the belt, you want nice straight lines there. You don't want any sag in the belt at all and you want it to, to be put, pulled reasonably tight on the alternator pulley, but not so tight that it generates extra friction. So what I suggest is set it up, spin it, and then pull it as tight as it'll go. You'll feel there'll be a point where it starts to generate extra friction by being too tight, extra resistance by being too tight. So then you can just ease it back a little bit before you, before you fix the stand in place. One thing that's really important to mention here, obviously you need this set up linearly perfect or pretty much perfect so you want the wheel absolutely in line with the alternator pulley which clearly isn't there but that's because i'm in the middle of setting it up the other thing to be aware of is that you on any wheel and this will vary with different wheels that you use you've got the rim bed in the center there and you, then you've got the rim walls and these walls vary in thickness as you'll probably know from you know doing stuff with bikes what you need is a, a belt width that fits purely in the rim bed you don't want it riding up onto these walls at all so make sure you measure the internal width of the rim bed ideally you want about a millimeter clearance or maybe maybe slightly more uh, not too much because it'll it'll rattle around but about a millimeter clearance between the between the walls and the belt will be will be good just minimizes friction because you don't want friction at the alternator end these pulleys come in various industry standards now the precise standard will 
depend on the alternator that you've got. But there are grooves in this pulley which will be spaced at a, at a standard spacing and they'll have a standard depth. All you need to do is measure the width of the grooves, measure the depth of the grooves and get a drive belt accordingly. There are quite a few drive belt suppliers online so if you just google one, I can't remember the one I used otherwise I'd, I'd post it in the link but I, but I can't remember it. But they're, they're not difficult to get hold of so you just, just measure that, measure it up uh, and look, look for what you need. You'll also need to just measure the circumference of the wheel at the diameter of the rim bed and the pulley and this spacing. So just make sure you've got a belt that's long enough as well because a, a typical drive belt that's used in a car is not going to be long enough because it's only made to go around uh, a pulley on the engine. So you need a longer one. Okay. So you can see what I've done here. Rather than bolting the stand to the base, I've put this, uh, this, these brackets and this piece of wood in. What that does is it just ensures the tension stays con constant on the belt. So the alternator is to the right, the right hand end, and the, the, the pedals in the front of the bike are to the left there. And what this means, rather than bolting this down, if I do need to change the drive belt or if I get a little bit of stretch in the drive belt, I can just add a sliver of wood into there and pull it forwards a little bit. And the stand not being bolted down means that it's easier to move around. If you need to move the project around anywhere, you can take the stand off the base pretty easily. Get the bike off and take the stand off the base without, without faffing around with you know bolts and that kind of thing. You wait on the on the stand. But once you sat on the bike pedaling, your weight keeps the thing in place. And you can see they usually have rubber rubber things at the end there, which which there's a lot of friction on there in the wood. So it doesn't tend to wander. I've been using mine for a long time, and it doesn't wander side to side. That it's front to back that you need to be concerned about because it's maintaining the belt tension on the alternator. Testing up. So we've got that connected in. Now what I'm doing there. Um, is testing which of these cables on the alternator does what. The reason for that is I couldn't get the wiring diagram off the internet for this alternator. Usually you can find wiring diagrams on the internet without a problem, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't get one for this one. So what you'll find when you're using an alternator, usually if you're using one with regu uh, voltage regulation and rectification built in, which is something I recommend, and most car alternators do have that circuitry built in. If you use a motorbike, a van or a truck alternator, sometimes they don't have it built in. And occasionally car ones don't, but most of them do. So just double check when you get in the alternator that it, that it does have that uh, circuitry in, otherwise you've got to build it in afterwards. And if you want more information on that kind of thing, or using a DC motor or an AC motor instead of an alternator, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction to the video, there is a separate video following this one which just discusses the pros and cons of each one uh, and which you know which is better for which application so here we're using an alternator and generally speaking these ones which have the circuitry incorporated have three wires coming out of them the big thick one this nice juicy one there that's the main power output so that is for powering any devices that you connect to it. In a car, it would go to the starter motor and then to the battery. Uh, it, it supplies the main power to the car, or in this case, circuitry, whatever you're using, to, whatever you're charging with it. Then you've got these two other smaller cables, and it's these that you need to identify. One is a voltage sensing wire, and one is the field coil ignition wire. The voltage sensing wire does exactly what it says on the tin and it senses the voltage in the battery and in the circuit. In a car, that is just connected straight to the positive terminal on the battery, and you're gonna do the same here, basically. The field coil ignition wire, what that does, again, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory from its name, to get the alternator generating power, you first need to apply a small voltage through the field coil, and that's because an alternator doesn't have any permanent magnets in it. And the way that any generating device works is moving either electrical charges through a stationary magnetic field or moving a magnetic field around uh, a charge. So the field coil uh, inside the alternator is attached to the field coil ignition cable and putting a voltage through there generates the magnetic field which enables the alternator to generate power when you turn it via the, turn the shaft via the drive belt. You don't need to keep applying a voltage to it 
as it's running because it will generate its own power so don't worry you don't need outside voltage to make the project work because that will kind of defeat the object of building a generator uh, you don't need to do that it's just to get it started once it does it generates its own power and it will then recharge the battery that you've used to get it started it only needs a tiny voltage it needs 12 volts sorry it only needs a tiny current usually to get it to get it going if you can't get the wiring diagram and you don't know which is which the way to do it is get a multimeter set it to resistance and measure the resistance of these wires the field coil ignition should have a low resistance because all it's doing is passing um, electricity through a, a wire coil, a copper wire coil, and then back out again in the circuit. So there's not much resistance. The voltage sensing wire will have a high resistance and that's due to the way that voltage uh, is, is measured. So the voltage one will have a high resistance, the field coil ignition will have a low resistance. And that's the way you tell the difference. I won't go into the whys and wherefores of, of using a multimeter. I'm assuming if you're building a project like this, you probably know how to use one. Uh, if you don't, when you get one, uh, or they always come with instructions and they're pretty simple to use. If you, you have a basic understanding of electrical circuits and that kind of thing, they're pretty straightforward to use. Uh, the only one word of warning really is that um, if you're gonna use it to measure current uh, as output, by the system you need one that's rated highly enough uh, to, to handle the current now if you m measure the current as someone's charging this from an alternator an alternator is capable of generating anywhere from 40 to to maybe 90 amps a, ca a car alternator and there's no resistance when you're checking current so it will just suck it into the uh, multimeter and it will melt <laughs> the insulation on the kit if it's not one that's rated highly enough it'll just melt the insulation on the cables and you know burn you and um, probably you know burst into flames or something so just make sure you've got one that'll handle the current you don't need to use it to, to measure current for this project you, don't, you only really need it for this for this purpose and maybe checking the voltage so you don't need it for that but if you are going to use it for that it's just a quick word of warning really next step then you can see that the battery is now uh, partially connected you can see there that the negative we can't quite see the negative terminal but that cable goes to the negative terminal of the battery and is clamped onto that bracket as you saw before and i'm just getting the uh, cable ready there for the switch so quick a quick thought on on cable ratings uh, at this point that is main three core flex that i've used mainly i use that because i just happen to have it um, knocking around and i'm probably envisaging that certainly that that's a four amp power battery so it's not going to i'm not going to be putting a huge amount of current through that cable have a think when you're setting the project up as to how much current you think you're going to be generating and get the cables accordingly and what i would say is over specify so probably or what happened to me is i thought i'd just build a bit of a novelty project and maybe charge my phone or something like that but i've, I've now got it set up to charge laptops run a sound system uh, charge four phones at the same time and various power packs and that kind of thing so it, you it may well evolve so get stuff get cables that are rated for for kind of the maximum that you can uh you know that you think you're going to do with it or you, you think you might end up doing with it at, at the same time be realistic it's very unlikely you're going to be able to charge you're going to be able to generate more than about 20 amps unless you're you're jason kenny or something like that you know you're not going to be chucking out the kind of wattage that's needed to, to to power enormous things so you don't need like industrial cables or anything quick word on on batteries that's a 12 volt 4 amp hour battery you do need a 12 volt battery because that's what the field coil inside the alternator needs 4 amp power wouldn't be enough to power much uh, downstream if you will in the circuit I, I use this word downstream i know it's not right but i, I like it so it, it, it's it, it, it describes what I what I mean and I'm sure you know what I mean by it so downstream in, in the circuit it, it won't power a huge amount and, and I chose that um, I chose that deliberately when I built this project because I wanted it to be a kind of a demonstration thing as well in other words when you stop pedaling and you, you, you stop generating power whatever you're charging switches off or if you're powering like a sound system or a speaker or something like that it, it switches off and so it, it's obvious to anyone who's watching it that it's your it's the power you're putting through the pedals which is generating the electricity uh, another way to do it and if you're doing it uh, to to generate power that you want to dip into at any time for instance if you want it to augment uh, you know a tiny house minimalist uh, lifestyle 
type of thing as a generator. You're probably going to want to store the power that you're generating on the bike. You might want to do a couple of hours and, and store the power that you've generated. In which case, get a bigger battery. Uh, get, you know, you use a, a bigger, a proper car battery, like a 40 amp hour, 60 amp hour battery, uh, or maybe a lithium, ion lithium polymer if you can, if you can afford it. Lead acid are a little bit more forgiving on charge cycles than, than lithium batteries, but uh, both would both will be all right. Modern lithium batteries are pretty good on that as well. You're gonna that's less efficient because any time you store electrical energy and then release it again, you, you, there are going to be some losses in the system because of the, the the chemical reactions that take place and that kind of thing and heat and and all that sort of stuff. So it's less efficient to store the power and use it later. But if if it suits you for your project, if that's what you need to do then you know you can do that the only thing to remember if you do do that is you'll need some way of regulating the current that goes into the battery because if you've got a 40 amp power battery on there and it's and it's low on charge when you start pedaling and putting power into it it'll suck a load of current out of the alternator and it will make it very very difficult or even impossible to pedal because it's sucking so much power out so remember that however much power you're charging is the power you've got to put through the pedals and into the alternator because of the conservation of energy. In fact, you've got to put more than that in because of there are losses uh, in the system. And I'll, I'll come to that a bit more in, in a little bit uh, with efficiency. But so however, whatever you're charging, the more you charge, the harder it's going to be to pedal. And the same applies obviously to the size of battery. You can get current regulators fairly easily on AliExpress or eBay or that kind of thing, electrical outlets probably RS components, something like that. We'll do them, they're sort of 30 quid. Uh, and it allows you to just put a limit effectively on the current draw for the battery. Don't use a current regulator if you're gonna be charging items because you, they need to be able to take whatever power they need in order to work properly. So only use that if you're using a big battery. I've used a small battery. Again, it keeps things nice and simple. Uh, you don't need a current regulator and it's very, it's more efficient than having a big battery and, and using the power later. So that's why I've made that choice. And those are the things to, to, to consider, um, you know, when, you, when you're looking at those, those decisions. Okay, uh, same again. You can see the bike there set up. You can see the belt is aligned uh, sort of straightforwardly on there. That's 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 set up now. This uh, tension device there. You can see the batteries connected in into the circuit both sides. And here is a brilliant photo of a switch. Again, it's three core mains cable I've used. You probably won't need that. That's for the field coil. So I've set this switch so that I can switch the field coil on and switch it off, just like an ignition in a car. But it's a hand switch. It won't take 13 amps, uh, so you're absolutely fine with this cable. I just happen to have a load of three core mains cable knocking around, which is why I've used it for everything. You'll see it later on, on, on the full machine. You can get away with, with, with a, a lower rated cable, but do check your alternator specs to see what power the field coil draws, because you don't, again, you don't want to use bell wire or something like that, which will only supply, but you know, it's only rated for a very small current, because if, if it does take a bigger current, it's going to get hot you know, and cause a problem, you know, at worst a fire. So always specify, always over specify your cables rather than rather than under or, or just on. Always over specify, it's just nice and safe. Uh, so that switch is connected into the field coil and it means I can, I'm gonna mount this on the bars, on the handlebars of the bike so that I can I can, can control it from the bars once, you, once you're pedaling. And there is, that's your base circuit. So that is set up with a with a basic output so what we've got there is batteries in place the negative there comes to the negative terminal here goes on to the negative of the alternator you can see that the main positive uh, cable from the alternator comes around there and goes into this connector just on there apologize for the quality of some of these photos they seem to be a little bit uh, a little bit blurred but uh, it gets the message across so we're, we're all right i think you can see there the positive terminal, the battery is connected to the positive from the alternator. And here you can see that there's a there's a cable coming out there and it goes off just up here on the stand and that goes up to the handlebars. 
that is the switch which was in the last photo to connect in here to the field coil wire which goes back into the alternator and activates the field coil and the reason I've done it like that is because that connects to the battery terminal as well as to the alternator so you can switch it in once it's generating power you switch it back out again and in this case I've connected the voltage sensing cable into there as well because what happens when I switch that switch is it will sense the voltage from the battery because it's connected to it there some alternators may require you to have that voltage sensing wire permanently connected to the battery. Just worth checking that for the alternator that you use. Uh, if that's the case, then make sure you do that. But make sure you get the right cable, because if you connect the field coil wire to the battery permanently, you just end up with a permanently activated field coil, and when you start to pedal, it'll be really, really difficult. So a quick word on how the alternator works. What you need to do to get it to, to work is get it up to speed. So get pedaling at your, at your normal cadence and then switch in the field coil. If you don't do that, it's very difficult to get it started because you end up with a, with a, with a periodic force uh, in the alternator, which interferes with the periodic force from your pedaling action. And I'll come to that later when I talk about the, the gear ratios and that kind of thing. So you can see there we've got the output, that is just a standard car, 12 volt car socket, car power extension socket, used to be called cigarette lighter socket, don't think they call that anymore. I've connected that up to the battery terminals as you can see because it will draw power off the battery um, at first and once you start charging power because the alternator is connected into that, it's going to draw it from the alternator. And the alternator will simultaneously power whatever is connected into that socket and recharge the battery. It's a lead acid battery so you can just leave it in the circuit just like a, like a car battery is permanently in the circuit in a car uh, and it will just top it up, keep it topped up. It does wear it out keeping it connected into the circuit so you could have another switch on the bar to switch the battery out of the circuit completely but this keeps it nice and simple and as we're only using a, a small battery I've had mine on for two years and it's still, still fine, it's still good enough to, to get the field coil going. It does act a little bit like a buffer as well, that battery. So once, if you plug something in, rather than you suddenly needing to up your pedaling power, it will suck a bit of power out of the battery and you can steadily increase your cadence, uh, sorry, your, the power output through your legs. So it works in, in a way a bit like a capacitor there. And you can also connect a capacitor um, into the circuit if you wanted to do that. Can be a good idea if you're connecting audio circuits um, like a, you know an amplifier because sometimes when they on the bass beats they draw a lot of power and then they draw less power in between so the capacitor just smooths that power draw a little bit and if you're not using a battery that's permanently connected into the circuit I would say you definitely need a capacitor in the circuit because that will just uh, even out any 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 power draws particularly from things which are periodic in the way they draw power like an amplifier you know uh, with with basic music so there you go, that's the, simple, that's the simple circuit setup. You can plug whatever you like into there. And the good thing about using an alternator for this project is that you know that the voltage it generates, which is depending on the, on the device, it's somewhere between 13.6 and 14.3, cause that's, that's ideal for charging a lead acid battery, a 12 volt lead acid battery. You know that the tolerance, anything that's designed to work in a car will work in this circuit. So, because you, you know that the voltage tolerance is going to be optimized for car for a car circuit, so it'll it'll tolerate eleven and a half to fourteen and a half volts, which makes it really simple, you know. And it means it's modular as well. You can put splitters on there. You can see I've got a splitter on on there. Uh, I, I stuck the the power rating for that splitter. Now it turns out this wasn't anywhere near powerful enough. It's sixty watts, and I actually melted it like an idiot. Uh, I put too much power on it. So again, it's just another, it's just another reminder to make sure that whatever you whatever you plug in needs to be rated uh, to the right power for what you're going to charge uh, from it. Really, I suggest you get uh, fused. Make sure you get something with fuses in. Usually they come in the in the plugs. Usually a, a, a fuse in those plugs. But if you get cheap stuff or something which is designed as an extension, which only has a, a fuse in the in, in the master uh, end of it, just make sure you, there's a fuse in the circuit which is which is gonna blow if there's a short or, or a problem. 
So you can see there, very high tech mounted switch up on the handlebars. This this has now significantly evolved, as you will know if you've seen my the, the first video in this series, which is a demonstration and overview of the bike as it is now. Uh, that's it's significantly evolved from this, but this was just to get the project going so I can start pedaling, get the alternator up to speed, switch that switch, and boom, we're generating power. Field coil comes on and uh, electricity comes out. There you go, that's charging up some stuff. So I've got a phone connected in there, I've got a Bluetooth speaker and a little power pack there, uh, all running off that. There's somebody pedaling out of shot, charging this stuff up. And you can see there how it's it's useful to you know you've got this modular system, you can just whack in extensions and splitters and you know put stuff in there. These car chargers, whack those in, and you know you can you can get USB power off them and all that kind of thing. This is an inverter. So what this does is changes the the DC output from the alternator. So remember the alternator will actually generate its alternating current but it's got rectification circuitry built into it, which changes it to DC. Uh, but you may want to run alternating current devices. Now, if you only want to run alternating current devices, you're probably better using an AC induction motor, which doesn't have the rectification on it, because there's no point changing it to DC and then changing it back up to AC, because every time you change it, you, you, lose, some, you lose some power, because there's inefficiencies uh, in the transforming uh, rectification operation so again choosing the right generating device is important in that regard but most people want to use DC power mainly I wanted the flexibility in this project to use either DC or AC so that the main output from the alternator is in DC this connects in and again because it's designed to work in a car it says 12 volts here uh, DC input 12 volts and it changes it into UK mains voltage which is 220 to 240 volts although it says 12 volts you know because it's designed to work in a car that it'll take 14.3 from the alternator so again you don't need to think about it you know it's going to work uh, so these are really handy again look at the power rating make sure it's sufficient for what you need otherwise it'll it'll blow it low to cut out this has got a 450 watt surge now anyone who's familiar with cycling wattages you'll know that 150 watts uh, is a is a reasonable base power 450 watts you're going to be hard pushed to maintain 450 watts for any length of time unless you're you know Chris Froome Tom de Moulin or something um, so yeah be realistic as well um, in, in, in looking at the power I would suggest if if you're only using AC and you want a you want an inverter to cover all of your needs up to 450 or 500 watts continuous will be more than adequate you don't need anything more than that uh, unless you're a beast you know and you can put out major wattage for a long time um, in which case feel free to, to go for a bigger one but this was enough for me because most of my power consumption is going to be DC uh, 150 watt max absolutely ample for me don't need any more than that so that is that that was the first kind of completed uh, level I got the project to and it's evolved significantly since then to be honest but uh, but that was the first sort of I ran it like that for a little while uh, charging various bits of stuff so there's a couple of things that are new here and I'll, I'll take you through those you can see I've bolted the extension bit on the front the extra height there just compensates for the fact that the back wheel is in a stand so do remember that when you're setting it up you do need to support the front wheel to be the same height as the rear wheel and, and because the rear wheel is elevated off the base you need to make sure you've got that height on the front wheel you can bolt the front wheel in if you want to some people do that bolt it in with uh, angle brackets i've left it free because again it just gives you a more natural cycling experience and i feel the more movement you can get on a bike the better really because if you end up doing a lot of indoor training, a lot of cycling, a lot more cycling than you realise is in, is in core muscles. And those core, on a completely rigid indoor training bike, those core muscles are getting no work whatsoever. So anything you can do to get a little bit of movement in there that makes it more realistic, uh, the better, really. Uh, better for your joints uh, as well. So you can see, I'll start at the top, you can see there, there is a, a, a light switch. Now that is a, it's a light switch. I had one knocking about in a Patras box. I've, I've, I've bolted that onto the handlebars. 
it evolves again beyond there because actually it's a bit crap having it on the handlebars because you, you can't get your hands on the on the bars if you want to use them on the tops so further down the line there's a plinth comes in and i'll show you that but for now the reason i've got all that switch in there you see there's a whole load more cables coming down there now the reason for that is if you're going to use this as a training aid what you want to be able to do while you're pedaling is switch in different amounts of load so say you've got two power packs a phone and a laptop charging you want to be able to switch those in at different times so that you can get an easier or a harder workout and you probably want to start easy and then build up and maybe you know whack something on that's a bit harder to charge put a tablet and a laptop on or something but you maybe don't want to start off with that at the beginning and you don't want to be getting off and on to to change circuitry so having it on the bars is what you need again this cabling is overkill for what i'm charging but i just had a load of I'd add a lot of that three core mains cable, so I'd, I'd recommend actually getting a, a six core or eight core even. I'm not sure you can get eight core, but if you can, uh, that's ideal because you've just got one or two cables running down there. So you see that's mounted on there. That's the field coil uh, ignition switch just on the left of that switch there that I've put on there. You can see there's a bit more stuff charging. I've got rid of that thing that I melted. Clearly it wasn't any use after I melted it. And I've put some splitters on there and some more USB charging apparatus. The inverter there is, is set up. It's worth making this circuitry nice and neat so that you can see what does what and you know change it around a little bit. You can't see clearly in this photo, but you'll see it in another in a future one. Those there are headlight bulbs from a car. And what that means is if I haven't got enough stuff to charge and I want to make it harder to pedal, I can just switch a bulb on and it adds a adds a chunk of resistance so these are these are 25 watts each these bulbs so you put one on you get 25 watts of extra resistance you put two on you get 50 watts now quick word while i'm talking about that alternators are not the most efficient generating device they're probably the least efficient of the three possibilities they're very simple and easy to use which is why i've used one here and they're extremely robust but in terms of efficiency they're not that good so although that bulb each each one of those bulbs is 25 watts because of the inefficiency in the alternator and then there are further inefficiencies due to the friction of the belt and the drivetrain and the electrical circuitry itself you can roughly double that in terms of the power that you need to put through the pedals so 25 watts turns into 50 watts of power that you've got to put out through the pedals so just keep that in mind when you're thinking about your, your wattages and, and ratings for things that you're charging and, and realistically how much you can charge modern alternators newer ones can be more efficient this isn't a particularly efficient alternator you can get better ones so bear that in mind when you're doing your calculations for what you, you can and can't power but but almost well always i've never heard of an alternator more than 70 percent efficient because because they don't need to be in a car again there's more about this stuff in the third video so if you want to really dive deep into that stuff watch that watch that other video there's a link in the description and that that talks about efficiencies and, and different generating devices and stuff you can see here a big power switch there a uh, big red switch has, uh, has appeared and that means i can switch everything in and out the circuit with one switch so it's a good safety switch and it means it switches everything off at the end of the session it turns the battery it, it isolates the battery from the circuit it isolates the alternator from the circuit and it isolates the uh, remote switch and the battery from the field coil completely so it's a double pole switch so i've used each pole uh, to do different things you can see the field coil uh, wires coming out of there you can see the main power input there and the battery stuff goes in the other side so Good idea to have a big switch, switches everything off. And also if, if something happens while you're on, someone can just boom, press that switch all off. I've never had such an emergency, I have to say, but uh, you know, you never know. You can also see there, there is a, a volt and current meter has appeared. Let me see if there's a better photo. Here's a better photo. You see the bulbs there um, as well. That's a, a volt and current meter. You've got volts on the top in red and current on the bottom in green. Good idea to have one permanently in the circuit. You don't need to mess about with a the multimeter then. You've got one in circuit and you can read what's going on. Those two wires are for the volt, uh, the uh, potential difference, the voltage sensing capability, and those are connected just into the battery. So what happens is when the alternator 
isn't running, when you're not charging anything, it will measure the voltage of the battery. So that battery is currently at 12.6 volts. It's slightly over voltage because I've probably just charged it. So it's, that's why it's slightly over voltage. Uh, when you start charging, because the uh, output cable from the alternator is wired into the battery, it will then measure the voltage from the alternator. So you can use it to check to make sure that your, your voltage regulation is working properly in the alternator because it, you know, it can go like any any circuitry so you can check on that and have a look if it does go and there is a problem then it's going to fry the battery and it might damage any componentry you've you, you've got downstream voltage is very important things are sensitive to voltage uh, current is not as important because stuff will just take the amount of current it needs the only important thing with current is making sure there's enough uh, there's a sufficient supply of it for whatever you're charging um, you can't kind of supply too much current uh, because it just won't be used. Whereas voltage, if the voltage is wrong, it can cause problems. That is the uh, current sensor. And you can see that is around the uh, the output from the alternator. Now it's reading 0 0.1 amps, even though we're not charging anything, just due to the way that that sensor operates. It's quite close to this wire, which is on the battery. So what it's actually doing, <clears throat> it's measuring a little bit of the current that's going through there, which is actually operating the device itself and there's a couple of LEDs that are on down there because the battery's in the circuit so that's the current that is measuring there and these things are only they're only accurate really to within you know 0 0.2 0 0.3 amps really anyway you can get really good ones that are more accurate but for this sort of project probably not worth not worth spending the money unless you unless you you know you're looking at it specifically from an electrical or electronic side of things um, so that's that's worth having in very cheap these uh, I think I got that for like under a tenner I think it was uh, again it could probably either Aliexpress or eBay or something okay you also see a sticker a little little post it there now I left that on at the time because I just wanted to remember the calculations that, that I've made and this is to do with the speed that the, the alternator spins at so important thing to remember about an AC generating device, whether you're using an alternator or an AC motor, is they have a minimum speed of operation at which they are stable for generation. Now, alternators are usually around 2,500 RPM. Sometimes they're 3,000 RPM and over. It depends which car they've come from and what the, what the arrangements are in the vehicle for, for doing that. So do check for your alternator what the uh, what the, the recommended minimum speed for it is if you spin it below that speed what happens is because of the way it works you get a periodically varying force um which which acts as a resistance to your pedaling and because for most people unless you are a super precise track rider or something like that most people have significant periodicity in the force that they put out through the pedals so in other words there's more force at sometimes a part of the pedal stroke than at other parts of the pedal stroke and the two periodically varying forces tend to cause interference and it all becomes a mess it becomes very difficult to pedal in fact and the lower the speed the harder it is to control that force now if you have a very very con consistent input uh, torque for the for the to, to turn the shaft of the alternator that doesn't matter as much uh, if you've got some kind of you, you can use alternators for uh, water you know water jet water powered generation now when you've got a very consistent water flow it doesn't matter as much because the the input isn't periodic so you don't get the same problem with the variation for a pedaling device you do need to spin it at the minimum speed there's no ifs or buts about that really it's, it's difficult and also if you if you go in lower speed it can sometimes throw the voltage regulation out and you can end up with with, with peaks and troughs and you really don't want that because you're going to if you if you're charging electronic devices it can cause them serious issues so how do you calculate the speed you need to spin it out two and a half thousand rpm sounds a lot but actually it's, it's, it's not that much so you see there what i've written is slightly underneath that wire but i've got gear ratio there is 50 15 and a typical cadence of 70. So what I've put there is, if I'm in the gear 50-15 and I'm pedaling at 70 RPM, the alternator will spin at 2,500 RPM. So how have we calculated that? It's all ratios. 
So now, when I got this bike, with it being a you know an old eBay especially, it had a weird it had a weird cassette on the back. The lowest cog on the back is fifteen, which I didn't even think you could get a cassette with the lowest cog of fifteen, but apparently you can. Most cassettes have a lower cog of eleven, uh, or modern ones even ten sometimes. So fifteen is unusual for a lowest range, but that's what it was here. So what you do, you've got your, your, your teeth on the front, and that's number of teeth, by the way, so 50 teeth on the front, 15 teeth on the back. If you whack that into a calculator, what you'll find is, to calculate the ratio, you go 50 divided by 15, gives you 10 over 3, or 3.3 .3 recurring. Then what you need, you've got a ratio between the wheel size and the pulley wheel on the alternator. And what you're looking for is the, the ratio of radii of those of those discs. <clears throat> now, the radius that you're measuring on the on the wheel, in fact on both the wheel and the pulley, is the radius from the point of contact of the belt to the centre of the axle. It's not the full radius of, of the wheel. Because wheels are often specified as they are with a typical as the radius with a typical tire on them. So it will be it will be less than that, you know, by maybe up to two inches, you know. So what you need to do is measure uh, from the where the belt contacts the wheel to the axle and the same on the alternator pulley. Now it just happens with this setup, I had an 11 to 1 ratio and I measured it in inches simply because it meant I could get a 1 in the ratio and if you're dividing by 1, obviously it's easier than dividing by 2.5 or whatever it would be in centimetres. So uh, again you do, you multiply then, you multiply your 3.3 .3 recurring from that 50 by 15 by this ratio and because this is 11 divided by 1 it's just multiplying by 11 so if we multiply that by 11 we get 110 over 3 or 36.6 recurring and now you've got your cadence so different people have a have a, an average cadence uh, which is slightly varying depends on your preference my my typical cadence is around 90 uh, but it's worth calculating it at the lowest typical cadence of anyone who's going to use the bike and most people most people's cadence is somewhere between 70 and 90 or 70 and 100 but but typical cadence is a 70 to 90 so i've used 70 here because that's a fail safe so you basically you need to pedal at 70 rpm or more which is the vast majority of people do anyway so you simply multiply that multiply that figure by the cadence so multiply by 70 and we've got 2,566.6 recurring RPM. So that's all in RPM because your cadence is in RPM. That's where the RPM, the units of RPM come from in the calculation. So that's 2,500 RPM. And that's without uh, any stress whatsoever. That's just with the setup as it is. And you'll probably find when you set it up that, that you'll have a perfectly acceptable RPM. But as I say, when you get the alternator, check what the RPM is on the alternator and just check the gear ratios on the bike. It's very easy to get higher. Say you had a 53-11 ratio on the gears, that's gonna give you a significantly higher RPM, you know, anyway. And you can you can change gear ratios to suit. Obviously there is an upper limit before you start having to do, you know, silly things to do it, but but it's gonna take care of the vast majority of alternators. Uh, just Just double check before you start spending money. So, a bit of a wider view of the circuitry, you can see it all as it's set up there. You can see these little connectors that I've used. Uh, these make it nice and easy to keep things modular. Better than soldering, just, you know, just easier really. And it means you can, you can take stuff out and put it back in and play about with the circuitry and, you know, charge different things if you want to uh, do that. So it gives you plenty of flexibility. And it also keeps things nice and clean. You can see what, what does what. And it gives you this is you know this is these wires go up to the switches at the top, so you can see which which switch is doing which thing. I suggest you colour code your wires because uh, it just makes it easier. Otherwise, you uh, like a few months down the line, you'll forget you know which bit is which. Um, yeah, you can see I've got uh, you know the, these these car plugs on. These are fused uh, extensions in there and splitters and so forth to uh, connect different bits to different bits. Plus, up there, you can see the inverter on there. You can see the splitters on there as well, and that's just a, just a close-up of the alternator being driven by the uh, by the drive belt. Uh, do make sure the, this is bolted in at the front, and what this is showing just here at the back. Uh, I forgot about the fact that 
these will only keep the alternator in position but they won't stop it flipping up on the axis of these bolts now when you're pedaling most of the force is coming through this top part of the belt there which is going to give the alternator a tendency to flip forward so it needs bolting in at the back now i've just bodged it there temporarily before i've bolted it just as i've noticed the problem uh, with a connector and a zip tie yeah that will be definitely be a bodge if it was on gcm wouldn't it definitely but don't worry i've, I've bolted it in uh, later on uh, so that's that that's set up there so yeah i suggest you get another bracket so you can you can fix it in at the back there just make sure it doesn't interfere with the pulley or the uh, or the drive belt close up of the switch you can see i've just labeled it up so that uh, i know what i'm i know what i'm switching in that's your ignition that's all the dc circuitry and that's for the inverter that's the ac load there and then those extra resistance that's for each of those bulbs that are in the circuit as well and that is that is how it is now so you can see i've added this plinth there and i've, I've bolted this switch uh, onto the plinth because it's a pain having it on the bars you can't get your hands positioned properly so uh, i've got the switch in there i've added fans fans are absolutely essential for any indoor training device as anyone who's ever used uh, ever used an indoor device will know got two fans on there and i've got another little one there that i can switch in separately this is otherwise known as the the testy cooler obvious reasons uh, that's a plinth there that's uh, set up with some loudspeakers on it there's an amplifier on the other side the overview video the first video in this series gives you a look through this whole setup as it is now i'm not going to go through it all now because it's in that video and uh, you know this one's long enough we, we, we were focusing on the base the base system for this you can see i've raised the front wheel a little bit there that was just to make it a bit more comfortable i've got better hoods and bar tape and all the rest of it on there and a better saddle so again it's just about comfort make sure that you you're comfortable long term that's that's a top priority for for any sort of cycling and there you go that's the uh, that's the full setup see how it's evolved um, as it's as it's gone on so that's it for this video do feel free to ask questions whack them uh, whack them down below and I'll, I'll i'll answer them if that's been helpful to you which i, I hope it has um please give me a Give me a like, give it a like, that'll be really good, really useful. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to see some other good, good juicy stuff coming up. We've got um, some science videos on, on how this stuff works and, uh, and, and you know, electromagnetics, uh, energy conservation and stuff like that. Uh, I'm also going to do some fun videos charging different things, you know, perhaps some extreme type of charging or, you know, something like that. So keep an eye out for them. There's some good stuff coming up there. Have a look at the other, vi other videos if you haven't done already. The one on the generators is definitely worth a look if you're if you're considering which which type of motor or, or whatever to use to generate power. So 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 give that a look. Thanks for watching.